Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Can everybody in the back hear me? Because they, they, There's a psychological thing. They put a microphone on you and you assume you're amplified, but I think this is just for the camera. So I, I want to make sure that you can actually hear me. Um, uh, thanks for letting me come tonight, and thank you guys for putting this on. It's, I, it's such a great, you know, when we started this campaign, it seems 187 years ago, uh, but last year, um, you know, a lot of folks were talking about voter fatigue and people not being energized or, or engaged in the process because of all the special elections last year, and to be honest, we've seen nothing but the contrary. Uh, we've seen a lot of rooms like this all over the Commonwealth. Uh, over the last year, uh, and I'm excited, and I'm grateful, frankly, not just as a candidate, but as a Democrat and a citizen, that you guys are this engaged in our party and how we choose our, our leaders. And I will res be respectful of the of the uh, the rules and the time. Um, uh, as the CEO of the Democratic Convention, the one of the most important jobs we had was making sure everyone spoke in the limited amount of time that they had. So I want except for Bill Clinton, but he was the one person who we were going to allow to talk for as long <laughs> as he wanted. It was a great speech. I actually lost 10 bucks on a bet to Chuck Campion uh, because he talked about 40 minutes longer than he was supposed to, but that's okay. Best 10 bucks I ever spent. Um, but uh, I'm running for lieutenant governor uh, because the next governor needs a partner uh, who understands government at all levels. As Michael said in my introduction, I've uh, served on the finance committee and the board of selectmen in my hometown. I uh, ran uh, the largest public law office in, in New England uh, and uh, where we worked on cases with every state agency uh, throughout the Commonwealth. I worked for, for uh, uh, the late great Senator Ted Kennedy for 14 years and I don't know if you noticed I was looking around while Michael was introducing me. I haven't been in this room since I was last here with, with him years ago uh, and he, loved, he used to love this room uh, and his grandfather. Um, so it brings back a lot of fond memories. And I, I have had the chance to serve for the president, work for the president um, uh, in the last two campaigns and as the CEO of the Democratic National Convention where we passed the most progressive um, platform in the history of our party, uh, where we, it said that my partner and I could get married if we wanted, the first platform of any party uh, in our country's history to say that, uh, as well as many other things that our party and, and all of us uh, believe in. I was very proud of that. Uh, and I also had the chance to chair the president's second inauguration uh, last January. Uh, but the work I'm probably the most proud of is the work I do uh, at, with my nonprofit, the Mass Military Heroes Fund. Uh, we serve, uh, sadly, 193 families from Massachusetts who've lost a loved one in active duty since the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a sad reminder to us uh, every time we have a new family to deal with uh, that there is still uh, conflict abroad that our young men and women uh, were sent to uh, and, and I remember very well sitting with Senator Kennedy when he uh, announced his opposition to the Iraq war. It was not a very popular thing to do, uh, but it was something that he stood by every day of his life um, because those decisions were incredibly important. Yellow card means we only have a minute left. Um, and, <laughs> or, <laughs> um, uh, and, and so, you know, th we've carried that through with the service we've done for these families. You know, I, I think the next lieutenant governor has a great opportunity to really help shape the future of Massachusetts. Uh, the things I want to do working with the next governor is really to, uh, to help make sure Massachusetts is the most competitive uh, commonwealth and, and state in the country, uh, and, and frankly, one of the most competitive economies uh, in uh, the country, or in the world, rather. Uh, and I want to do that through many ways, which I'll probably answer through questions in here now, but um, I think we've got to take a long, hard look at who we are as a commonwealth. You know, when John Adams uh, wrote our constitution, He's getting ready, so I'll finish this quick. Uh, when John Adams wrote our Constitution, he made us a commonwealth for a reason. Uh, because it means we have a commitment from the collective to the individual, and the individual back to the collective. I think government has gotten away from that, and I want during this campaign and during uh, our administration to make sure that we give you the government that you deserve for the sacrifices you make each and every day, and a government that reflects our values and who we are as Bay Staters and Democrats. First of all, who participated in the Raise Up effort? I'm assuming every single person here. Um, thank you for that effort. I mean, it, I think it's, it is one of the, this is something that um, is critical to who we are as Democrats and as, I think, Americans, is giving someone an opportunity to earn a wage uh, that they can, and I wouldn't even call it a livable wage because it's not a livable wage, but to have a, a basic minimum wage and a, and, a, and, a no, and a knowledge that for certain hours they'll actually be able to, to live and survive. It's something that we fought for every year in the United States Senate when I worked for Senator Kennedy. And in 1996, I'll never forget, we worked hard in 95, hard to increase the federal minimum wage and it went down in, with a procedural vote in about 10 minutes. And I remember Senator Kennedy coming back to uh, 
the office and he said, what's next? And he went into his office and, and I said, well, how could you do that? You know, you just lost this big vote. And he said, I'm going to go next week and the next bill that comes to the floor of the Senate, I'm going to, I'm going to vote to move to amend that bill to increase the minimum wage. And then I'm going to go the next week after I lose that one. And, and he did. And you know what it led to? Bob Dole resigned from the United States Senate. Uh, to seek the presidency and resign being majority leader. He drove him out of the Senate on the issue of minimum wage because it's a, it's a, it's a human rights issue. It's a women's issue. It's a minority issue. It's a, it, I mean, it's a small business issue. It's all these things. Bottom line is I support the, the ballot initiative, 60%. Um, uh, I support indexing. I think it's a critical part of this. Uh, there, is a, there are politics in the indexing, uh, but I, I support um, the Senate bill getting it to 11. I think we're not going to Probably get there, but I, I do support that. Uh, and getting there as quickly as we can, uh, because the purchasing power of our current minimum wage is ridiculous. Uh, and there are folks out there who need to, frankly, uh, be proud of the work they do every day and, and bring back, which they are, and bring back a wage that they can actually feed their family. The fact that there are people who work 40 hours a week in Massachusetts and still live in poverty is disgusting to me. And so we have to work hard, because that's who we are as Bay Staters. So. Do, do you hear the question? He'd like our minimum wage to be the equivalent of three gallons of gasoline. Uh, I don't think we want to because hopefully we'll eventually develop an actual policy on fuel and energy that will reduce our, our, our cost of, ga of uh, gas uh, per gallon. Uh, you know, I'd look, I, on the minimum wage, because uh, I'm assuming now I can talk either, do you want me to talk more about minimum wage or about, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, it is, what excited me so much about this campaign when it started was we sort of started right around the time raise up started their signature gathering. Um, you know, we'd been at it for a few more months, but people started paying attention to the race. And it, it brought an energy to this, to the statewide campaigns that, that wasn't there before. Um, uh, and it, not only on minimum wage, but on uh, the earned sick time, which I think is also critically important. Uh, and so, I, you know, I will do everything we can, uh, and we did during the, the, the process of getting the signatures and stuff, we'll do everything we can to make sure that, that uh, the minimum wage is increased and indexed. Um, uh, and also we'll work on the price of, uh, of a gallon of gasoline, too, to the extent that the lieutenant governor has any control over that. I get three minutes to answer that question, and that's uh, almost impossible to do, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. I mean, uh, we've got, this economy has to be everybody's economy, and, we, 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 and we've got to reach into um, to communities that aren't getting their, their share, to your, to your point. Um, but we've got to start by growing the overall economy and then have targeted programs so that we can make sure that we're giving people a good education. You know, th there's this guy I went to high school with who, um, who dropped out of St. John's High School in Shrewsbury because we all thought we were terrific. Uh, and he went to a Voc Tech school, Worcester Voc Tech. And um, he now has, is, he's probably on our most successful uh, alumni list because he got a Voc Tech a degree and now owns a plumbing company. Um, uh, we've got to respect the fact that everybody in our in our Commonwealth learns a little differently. <clears throat> so we've got to provide in the inner cities. We've got to provide uh, and the communities. We've got to provide better education opportunities. We've got to give them opportunities to get uh, higher education, learning, all those things, because that is how we we give them um, an opportunity to get into the business community. We also uh, we need to grow the economy. You know, we've got to make Massachusetts a lot more competitive by going through every aspect of life in Massachusetts and finding ways to grow our economy. Now, how we do it with um, programs with the state, uh, with giving uh, investment programs and tax incentives to uh, communities and to businesses that, uh, that do apprenticeship programs. Yeah, yes? One sentence, one sentence follow <clears throat> All over sure. the world except here in this country, there are mechanisms in place in every city that actually do this, and they're called urban core markets. And if you go to any city in the world, yeah. Santiago, or, or, or yeah, you know, like, all, all over Africa. Sure. This is a massive uh, Mogadishu market, which has basically brought 12 refugees from, from that that failed country to open up businesses in, in Dudley. So we need to actually take a look at that as a yeah. mechanism to actually put thousands of people back into low-risk businesses. I, I, we absolutely will. I mean, uh, well, one of the, here's one of the problems I, I have with, with government right now is no one is willing to say we don't have all the answers, but let's look at them. You know, I, I was saying to somebody earlier today, I am proud to be from Massachusetts. I think we, we've led on so many things throughout our history, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from other places. And that doesn't mean that we can't bring examples and experiences from around the world, not just around the country here to Massachusetts and learn from it. So I'd be interested in learning more about that. I, I don't uh, know about those uh, urban, what is it called? Urban, urban common markets? Market. Urban core markets. Okay. Uh, you're hitting right on a big piece of what we, what I hope to do, 
uh, there are three key things uh, that you can't articulate necessarily in a three minute uh, opening. So uh, three key things I'd like to do for the next governor. First, I would like to chair a competitiveness council that will look at things like your idea, ways that we, because I think, by the way, those types of new ideas can help us become more competitive. So can providing early childhood education and all these different factors, because that helps make Massachusetts a place more people want to grow their business. So want to do that and work with leaders all across Massachusetts to do that. Next thing is a is an efficiency and effectiveness um, uh, project that I want to run in government. And, and look, I, I get that everybody hears, you know, we want to make government more efficient and effective. I, I know that. Um, uh, I, I really want to get to the core of it, to the issues that you're laying out, because um, I've worked in state government. When I, when I worked for the attorney general, we represented a, a lot of state agencies uh, as their attorney. So we worked with them. We saw the good, the bad, and, and the indifferent. Uh, and what I meant when I started, when I said, well, you need a government that is worthy of the sacrifice you make, I mean it. You know, We see it right now. There are thousands, by the way, of, of hardworking people who work in state government every day who do it because they believe in the Commonwealth and the things that they do. Um, they're not given the proper training. They're not given this, uh, the right support and resources. Uh, you know, folks are getting advanced within departments, uh, and then they end up running an agency of, you know, a thousand people, and they've never been trained how to manage or how to deal with a budget, and it's not necessarily their fault. It's their fault, I guess, for accepting the job, but who doesn't want to get a promotion? But we owe it to them to make sure they have the skills and resources. I also think uh, we owe it to uh, the taxpayers to make sure that, the, I mean, it's customer service that we're providing. Uh, and, I, and I really do think that we've got to take a colossal look at overhauling how our government's done, because there is some duplicative efforts. Uh, I want to make sure that we route those things out so that government's easier for people to deal with, that they can call somebody and get an answer. They can go online and get something, and then it's not, and the answer isn't, sorry, that's not me, click, but that it's interconnected. It's no longer siloed government, but it's a commonwealth's government. So it's interconnected so that agency and agencies work together to solve that person's problem. Now, when I worked for Kennedy, he used to always say uh, that it's the line in between the line on your resume that's really going to describe the work that you do the most. It's, you know, you'll never see it written down about the job of government. Uh, but the job is solving problems. And I've been in the solutions business uh, in my entire life. And that's a big problem we have in state government right now is no one trusts government to do the job that they're supposed to do. They tolerate it a lot, sadly, because they have to, but they don't trust it to do the job right. Uh, and that is a travesty in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in this country. And as Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to work every day to earn back that trust. Because then, by the way, when the governor wants to introduce a budget, it calls for a billion more dollars to invest in all the things that will make us more competitive and grow our economy and provide for a social safety net and all those things that we believe in. The taxpayers, your average everyday taxpayers, are going to say, why am I going to do that? I'm looking at the DCF stuff on the front page. I'm looking at this stuff. Why am I going to give you more money? We've got to earn that trust back because we can't have progress without that trust. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're following up with that. Um, because we started this campaign right around the time the governor introduced that package, the $1.9 billion increase. Yeah. Uh, and it was for the two things, by the way, that are the biggest tools for economic growth, education and transportation infrastructure. Those are the biggest tools for economic growth anywhere. Anybody tells you there's something else, they're, they're not being truthful, or they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and I wanted it to succeed, and I, and, I, and I celebrated it, because a budget document is a priorities document. It tells what's the most important things for, for the governor, for the person introducing the budget, and how they're going to pay for it. Um, the problem was that, on the other side, virtually of that front page when it announced it, was at the time the EBT stuff, and a bunch of other stuff going on in state government, that folks just said, I'm not going to, we're not going to take that gamble. It's a travesty, because the investment we could have made uh, in transportation and education would be would be critical and would put us on a much stronger path for economic growth, but they just didn't trust it. What I would do as lieutenant governor is, first of all, start, and, and, and I love our governor. I think he's a great guy and he's worked very, very hard, and, and our commonwealth is doing incredibly well under him. Uh, I would have started by working with our partners in the legislature and others uh, to make sure that we all understand our collective priorities um, so that we we, we, have, we present a budget to the Commonwealth that we all stand by and we, and we are willing to support. Um, because what ends up happening is, and we saw it during that debate, the governor introduced this number, legislature came in at this number, and what did we talk about? I call it debating the Delta. We talked about that money in between. There was $33.5 billion more in the budget that got discussed by about 25 people in Ways and Means. There's... A there was a debate of a delta, and that's all anybody in the public ever heard about. 
we've got to go through every aspect of our budget to make sure we can then go back and say to folks credibly, you know what, this increase for this is worth it because here's how we've built a better, stronger, uh, more effective government for you. Uh, and here's why you should trust us on these improvements because here's the economic benefit in the long run. Um, what do I do now? Yeah. Uh, I run a small nonprofit uh, and campaign. Uh, uh, honestly, I, I earn no income, so anyone wants to buy me a beer when we're done, that's fine. Um, but, um, but uh, no, God, no. <laughs> God, no. No, no, no. Uh, I saved wisely and spending poorly right now. But um, uh, the job of lieutenant governor. So there's, there's few um, constitutional responsibilities to, to the job. Uh, running the, chairing the governor's council. Uh, which approves uh, judges um, uh, and judicial appointments. Uh, right now, there's actually a bit of a conundrum because the governor's chairing the council. He doesn't have constitutional ability to break a tie. So we've actually had a few judges go to a 4-4 split, and then they, their nomination's dead. Um, so it's an, an odd uh, power. Uh, what I think is the most important job of the lieutenant governor, and I think the biggest prism you have to look at it through, is the job of the lieutenant governor is to be the acting governor if the governor is not able to fulfill their obligations. So if they're out of the state, um, something happened to them where they're incapacitated or whatever, that is one of the most important. I mean, you're electing someone who could very possibly, within an hour of the governor taking the oath, uh, step into those shoes and do that job. Uh, it's a critically important uh, role in state government that enough people don't give enough attention to, particularly now since we don't have one. Um, but it's a critically important role. Uh, and, and the rest of it is a lot of assumed power. So you negotiate with the governor, uh, and I've met with almost all of our previous lieutenant governors uh, of both parties um, in the last year to get a sense of, of what they thought of the job. You, it's a lot of assumed power. Um, and so you work with you know, you know, the governor to, to lay out things like I have about what I'd like to accomplish as lieutenant governor. Uh, I'd like to be a liaison for cities and towns, which is why I've been focused on working with local elected officials all across the Commonwealth. I was honored this morning to get the fifth, uh, the mayor, the endorsement of the fifth mayor uh, in five weeks uh, from all across Massachusetts, the mayor of Taunton today. My first mayoral endorsement doesn't count toward the five, but it was Tom Menino that I got last year uh, while he was still in office. Um, and, and that's an important role because cities and towns need a voice within the administration, uh, and I want to be that voice. I also want to work with our federal partners and make sure that some of these unfunded mandates that are constantly getting pushed down on the Commonwealth, and then the Commonwealth, frankly, pushes down on cities and towns, uh, that we can work hard to, if not fund them better, to mitigate the impact a little bit better for cities and towns so that, I mean, that's where the where a lot of the real governing happens is in every city uh, hall and town hall and where the impact can really be felt in, in people's houses. So I, I want to be a partner to the next governor, um, but, you know, it, it, it is ultimately up to the governor other than those, those constitutional responsibilities about how much uh, he or she allows me to do. But uh, I've been Menino's best advice he ever yeah, well, he's given me a lot of great advice in the 20 years I've known him, but the best advice he gave me when I laid out what I wanted to do with the job and how I want to be the ombudsman for state government and be a voice for folks, uh, he said, do me a favor, uh, Steve. He calls me Stevie, so I'll say Stevie. He said, uh, say it every day. Say it every day, everywhere you go. And he said, by the time these governor's candidates are done winning their primary, it'll just be a fait accompli, <laughs> and that'll be what you'll end up doing. Uh, so that's why I talk about it every day, uh, but what I hope to do with the job. So thank you for asking. There's actually... Um, was a bill that was that's being introduced or was introduced today that that um, I'm glad it's being done before we take office, but it would have been one of the things that I want to focus on uh, when we get elected. Uh, that was that was to um, appoint two active teachers to the board of education. So right now the law only allows one retired teacher, uh, and and that's fine. And look, it's a little, but um, but it's not enough. We need folks who are in the classroom every day. Uh, you know the you know the tangentially the board of nursing registration in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts doesn't have one registered nurse on it. So, I mean, those that we, we need folks in those disciplines in the policy making position so they can inform what we're doing. Now, I am a, a huge fan of public education. My, uh, my, if I wasn't, my mother, my sister would kill me. My sister's a fifth grade teacher in Lunenburg. And my mother, since my dad was on strike when I was about four or five years old, uh, my mother had to take a job because uh, there were three young ones at home. And uh, she became the public school secretary at the public elementary school. And 40 years later, she is still there. And my father convinces her every day that the fate of public education rests on her staying there <laughs> and not joining him in retirement. Um, 
<laughs> but we can do it by making smart uh, policy decisions about inclusion and about engagement. You know, you guys are all here to um, listen to candidates talk about what they'll do in office. What we need to do is make sure we're listening to you once we get into office. That this isn't just about needing your help, although we do, to win. It's about needing your help to, to govern uh, and engaging more folks. Now, in a room like this, you don't have to tell people that they need to stay engaged after Election Day because you guys do. Um, but we do need your help telling your friends and your family and your classmates and your colleagues uh, that this is your government and we've got to get engaged in it. And, and so uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think there are parts. I listen to my sister talk and her teaching friends who come over a couple times a month. Um, we talk about education all the time. And, you know, there are things that I never would have known about the impact. And that's a powerful thing for a politician to hear. Um, and, and, and we should be forced to go to schools and forced to see what happens, and not just on the good and fun days, but <laughs> on the days when you're really struggling with a particular student. Um, and we should be forced to understand that a formula that was written 21 years ago for ed reform may not be the formula that works right now. Uh, and that the systems we put in place at a time when there were seven pages on the internet may not work in the 21st century and in the, the world and the economy that we have right now. Um, uh, there needs to be colossal changes to how we administer government uh, but it needs to be done with the inclusion of everyone uh, in the process. And I, I couldn't agree with you more that, um, that folks don't truly understand what goes on in the classroom unless they're there uh, or unless that voice is represented in government. So um, hopefully that bill passes. But if it doesn't pass, I'm going to push hard uh, once we get in office to make sure that more folks like that are represented. Uh, and by the way, sorry, that when we're picking a cabinet and agency heads, that folks are engaged. I want to make sure that the process of putting together an administration for the next governor uh, is one that involves people when picking a secretary of education and when picking commissioners because we don't want to just choose somebody that we know and trust. We want to make sure that there's someone who can talk to the community uh, that they're hoping to represent and, and work with uh, and really have that respect. So, um, All right. That's that all we have time for. Thank you, guys. Thank you.